Um, so thank you all for, for joining today um, for this presentation. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself first, and then I'm hoping that we can there can be a little bit of interaction um, from you all. So my name is Mary Alice Scott. I'm a medical anthropologist, um, and my research um, for the last um, 15 years has focused on various aspects of health equity in Mexico and in the United States. Um, and so more recently, about seven years ago, I started working in graduate medical education and really looking at how we could apply some of the concepts that I was um, studying in, in some of my previous projects to graduate medical education. So I currently serve as the executive director of the New Mexico Primary Care Training Consortium, which is an organization that supports primary care residency programs across the state of New Mexico. And we've built a lot of this health equity work um, into into our, uh, our, the work that we do as a consortium in supporting residency programs. And I'm also a college professor uh, at New Mexico State University, so I'm still engaged um, in some health equity research in that capacity. And I just realized I'm not on my first slide, so I'm going to back up so you'll get a preview of the presentation. Um, all right, so I, I wanted to uh, just start by um, asking folks who are in the room what you think about when you think about the the term health equity. And Ali, I'm hoping that maybe we can see that people can use the chat and just post some, um, just post words or phrases or things that come to mind when you think about um, the, the term health equity. I'm seeing resources. opportunities, access. Okay. Yeah, those are, I think, really great words to describe some of the issues that we see or some of the related concepts around health equity. So I want to share um, the World Health Organization's health equity definition and point out a couple of things about this definition that I think are um, are important to, to pay attention to. So I'll, I'll first I'll read it just um, just so uh, everyone can follow along. Um, I do I do see another universal treatment options. That's a great uh, great con contribution to the definition of health equity. So the World Health Organization's definition of health equity is that it is the absence of unfair, avoidable, or remediable differences among groups of people whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by other dimensions of inequality. So it's a really broad uh, definition in that, in that sense. They also argue that health is a fundamental human right and that health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential for health and well-being. And so I want to point out a couple of things about this definition that I think are really important. Um, first is that there's kind of both a negative and a positive framing, right? So um, the, the first part is really defining health inequity, right, and saying that, that equity exists when we have an absence of inequity, so those unfair, avoidable, avoidable or remediable differences. Um, so I, I just want to give an example here. If, if I'm born um, with a genetic mutation that limits my ability to walk um, without assistive devices, that doesn't necessarily mean in itself because I have that mutation, that there's health inequity that exists, right? But if I don't have access to the resources that I need to live to my the full potential of my life, then that would, would be inequity. And so I think that leads to the positive framing, which is everyone being able to attain their full potential. So if I have that genetic mutation, I may not be, a, I may not run track and field, although I might, right? Um, that may not be something that that I do in my life that might be beyond my potential, but there's a lot that I can do. And if, if I'm able to reach my full potential, given sort of the biological characteristics that I am born with, then that would be health equity. And I have I will share these slides, too. So if people are interested in finding this definition and, and some of the additional work that the World Health Organization does around health equity, I've included the um, the link there. And um, as people may have seen this uh, this image, this is one of my favorite images um, to talk about uh, the difference between inequality um, and 
or between equality and equity. And you all may be really familiar with this, but I think it's it's important to, to talk about um, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So inequality is really unequal access to opportunities. And so that's the top left picture. And basically what you're seeing here is that the person on the left is way more likely to get an apple than the person on the right because the tree is leaning to the left and there are a lot more apples on the left side of the tree, right? So equality would really give everyone the same thing. Um, so, uh, so what you're seeing here is that the two people now have access to a ladder, but it's the same height. The ladder is the same height for both people. So that means it actually makes it much easier for the person on the left to get even more apples, but the person on the right still actually doesn't have access, right? So they're still not getting apples. There are still fewer apples on that side of the tree. Um, and the ladder is not, the tree is still leaning to the left. So the ladder is really not tall enough for them to be able to access. So sometimes equality, giving everybody the same thing, really only maintains existing inequality because there's no added support for people with less access. And so that leads us to equity, right? Which is where we create tools and, and strategies that would uh, that address inequality. Um, so people may need those different tools and strategies based on where they started from. So in here you see the example of um, one person receives a lower ladder than the other person because the tree is leading to the left. So the person on the left doesn't really need that, that higher ladder. The person on the right um, does have the higher ladder so they're able to reach the, the apples. I think it's really important to recognize here, and I think this is what I really love about this particular image, is that equity, providing the tools and the resources um, that, that people need to get access to resources, actually can only take us so far if people, if the resources available are not also equitably accessible. So in this case, right, you have all these apples over on one side of the tree and not very many on the other. And so a key component of equity is really thinking about justice. And that's really about fixing the system. Um, so, so, that we, so that it's not just trying to improve access to existing resources, it's really thinking about how those resources um, come to be in the first place. What are the systems that make those available and what might we need to do um, to increase e equity within systems? And so, um, so this is really thinking about the root causes of the inequities that we're seeing. And so what you can see in the image is that really what needs to happen is that the tree needs to be straightened up and the apples need to be evenly distributed across the tree. So that way, when people are provided with the resources and the tools that they need to be able to reach the apples, everyone can reach them and everyone can reach them um, in equal uh, capacity. So the next thing I wanna talk about is why does this matter for GME? Why do we need to understand what health equity is um, and what, what do we do with it um, within GME? So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is that there are many health equity concepts and practices that are included in both common and specialty program requirements across a number of specialties. I'm gonna focus on primary care because that's the that's the work that, that I do, but um, this is not exclusive to primary care. Um, and so if you're working in other areas, um, this would also could also apply. Um, so that that's one thing. And then and then I think the bigger thing, and I will talk about this, it's not, we shouldn't just do health equity because it's required, right? So we should do it because it improves health for the people that, that we serve. And then we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of the requirements in graduate medical education, I am seeing, uh, you know, over with a couple of revisions to program requirements in family medicine and a couple of other specialties, an increased focus on health equity within the requirements. Um, in the common program requirements, this has been part of the systems-based practice competency for a while, um, that residents must demonstrate an awareness of and responsiveness to the larger context and system of healthcare, including the structural and social determinants of health, as well as an ability to call effectively on other resources to provide optimal health care. So I think that last um, box, the justice box, is, is really what this is talking about. Um, how how do we teach residents to understand the systems in which they work and and really be respond to them um, 
in, in particular ways so that they can address those social and structural determinants of health that their patients are facing on a regular basis. And that's in the common program requirements. So that's across all residency programs. And then there are some more specific ones. I'm gonna go through them a little bit more quickly because I wanna make sure that we have time for a little bit of, of discussion. Um, but uh, this, this one is um, family in family, the family medicine program requirements under patient care. Um, so that residents must demonstrate competence to independently integrate the family medicine approach to patients, all patients essentially. And one of the key things that is focused on in this um, requirement is understanding allostatic load and the structural determinants of health. So um, I'm going to talk about structural determinants of health in, in, a, in a little bit, but this is you know called out in the requirements and this is new. Um, in the family medicine program requirements as of the last couple of years. And so um, residents need to understand what structural determinants of health is, what does that concept mean um, before they, they can really um, address that in their care for patients. And then if we look at pediatrics as another example in under patient care, um, pediatric residents need to be able to incorporate consideration of the impacts of social determinants of health and advocating for social justice. So this is, I think, really interesting within the pediatrics requirements that there's this specific call out to advocate for justice. Um, and so understanding that justice piece of the health equal, um, of, of health equity in that framework is really, really important um, for um, specifically in pediatrics, but I think across the board. And then if we look at internal medicine, um, they're, they, they're um, under interpersonal and communication skills, one of the requirements is that residents must demonstrate competence in communicating effectively with patients and patients' families across a broad range of socioeconomic circumstances, cultural backgrounds, and language capabilities. And that is challenging if, um, if residents don't understand those social and structural contexts in which patients live. And so it becomes really critical to focus on those. And I'll share one more from psychiatry. Um, so the, this is for medical knowledge, actually, which I find really, really interesting because we often think about medical knowledge as being really restricted to kind of physiological um, physiological knowledge. But within psychiatry, um, residents must demonstrate their competence in the knowledge of biological, genetic, psychological, sociocultural, economic, ethnic, gender, religious, spiritual, sexual orientation, and family factors. And so that really requires quite a broad understanding of the context in which patients live. So, so that's, you know, I think it's important to see that this is really explicitly laid out in the requirements for a number of different specialties. Um, and I think it requires, uh, in my opinion, um, health equity is not necessarily something that all of us are, are trained in, in, in the process of our um, our education. And so it, it really requires a lot of times some additional and new learning for faculty who may not be um, experienced in health equity to begin with in order to be able to help residents become competent in these areas. But I think more importantly, not it's not just about requirements and having to fill requirements. The goal of medicine is to improve the health of the people that we're serving. Um, yet, most of the factors that impact health outcomes are not the clinical visits. And so I want to share with you um, a, a graphic that um, this is actually from the AAFP, from the American Academy of Family Physicians, but th this is commonly recognized. There are a number of different organizations that use this graphic. It originally came from a study um, by the um, Kellogg Foundation several years ago. Um, this, this, uh, this is endorsed by the World Health Organization and many other national and international health organizations. And so what this graphic is showing you is that clinical care is really makes up about 20 percent. It's it's 20 percent of the of the reason um, that uh, that we see differences in in health out or 20. It contributes to 20 percent um, of health outcomes. The larger contributors to our health outcomes are health behaviors, 30 percent. So you know what what people are doing. Are they taking their medicine? Are they exercising? Um, are they um, doing the things that they, that they need to be doing on an individual level? Um, Forty percent is the social and economic environment, which really impacts both health behavior and clinical care. And I think it's important to recognize that. 
So if you live in a place where there's not a lot of access to transportation, it may be harder for you to get to the clinical care that you need to improve your health. If you live in a place where it is not really safe to walk outside, getting exercise might be really challenging or difficult. Um, so, uh, so I think they're interrelated and it's important to recognize that. And then 10% um, is, is related to the physical environment. And that would be really be, um, be things like, um, are, you know, the, um, are there polluting factories close to uh, where people live that would have a negative impact on their health, for example. So I think it's important to recognize that that clinical care piece is a really small piece of the entire picture in terms of the drivers of health. And so if uh, physicians really want to make an impact, um, there, there's got to be some connection to those other factors in some way, even though the, prim the primary work that they will do is in clinical care. And I think the other thing that's important to recognize is 20% is not insignificant. So it's not that the clinical care is not really important in terms of of improving health outcomes for populations, um, but it is one piece of a much larger picture. Okay, so I just want to um, maybe stop talking myself for a minute and let and let people uh, chime in. Um, is there is there anything that's kind of coming to mind for you right now in terms of thinking about teaching health equity or integrating health equity into residency training? Either questions or comments or thoughts or in, anything that's kind of going on in your in your mind right now. So what I will tell you what I often hear, oh, I see something in the chat. Um, I work out on a remote island and health equity is very difficult there just due to the geography. Yeah, I think that's a really important point um, that the that physical environment um, is a really critical critical piece and it connects to all of those other pieces. So if you are, um, if it's difficult, you know, because of the physical environment to get to healthcare um, appointments, um, that's going to affect clinical care. Um, if it's uh, if it, it if if people don't have access to other kinds of resources that are really important um, in order to maintain health, that can also be really challenging. So thank you for for contributing that. Um, some of the other things that I often hear from people is. Um, okay, that's that's great. I understand it. I get it. Um, health equity is important, um, but I how how that's a huge topic. Residents already have so much to learn. How in the world are we going to incorporate this into our education and training? And so I want to offer today um, one model that we use that I think helps. Um, both kind of make it, um, it provides a framework to kind of hang the training on that you want to do and also helps integrate it into existing training. Um, so that model, and you all may be familiar with it, is called structural competency. Um, this was a, a model that was developed around 2011, I think was the first publication um, around this. It was developed by um, medical, within the context of medical school to train undergraduate um, medical students um, in health equity frameworks. And it's since been really um, moved much more broadly than just graduate medical education. Um, there's also training provided to social service organizations and, and legislative bodies, and um, it's moved way outside of just medicine as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So that first, to define what structural competency means, the idea um, initially was to be able to frame it within the context of those core competencies that you need to be teaching um, in, in medical education. And so to sort of frame it as another competency um, that's really important to learn. And so the definition um, that was developed by people who developed this, this concept initially is the capacity for health professionals, communities, and governments to recognize and respond to health outcomes as the downstream effects of broad social, political, and economic structures. And so you all may have heard um, the there's a parable of the starfish. That's really where this downstream and upstream terminology really came from. The idea is that um, it, you know, people are seeing all of these starfish, or or sometimes the story is people um, in a river. Uh, drowning, um, and they're they're coming down the river and they're drowning, and people are jumping into the water to save to save the starfish or to save the people who are drowning in the water. Um, and the idea is that there's a reason that that's happening, right? And this is the metaphor for health equity. There's a reason that people are drowning, and we need both the people who are saving 
folks from drowning and also the people who will go upstream um, to, to the source of this, what's happening upstream that's causing this to happen in the first place. So that's the idea with structural competency is to train health professionals to really be able to look upstream and understand that what they're seeing in the clinic and in the hospital, that's the downstream impact of something else that's going on. And we really need to understand that something else and figure out how we as health professionals um, can, can address those issues. So um, I'll share these slides afterwards, but um, there's a um, a spoken word artist named Clint Smith, who's really done um, a lot of work around health equity and health inequity. Let me try this. We'll see if it works. As a child, my father would tell me stories of ancient Egyptian warriors traveling for endless days and nights across infinite desert plains, showing signs of endurance and bravery I could only dream of emulating. He would tell me that upon their return home, these warriors would be welcomed with a feast worthy of their bravery on the battle. Years later, as a teacher in greater Washington, D.C., I too now find myself traversing a desert, though it is not the one I envision. A food desert is categorized as a poor urban area where residents cannot afford or are not given access to healthy foods and grocery stores. Every day at 2.45, I watch my students hop onto this leaking submarine of a school bus Every block bringing them deeper into an ocean where the only fish they find are fried, where fruits and vegetables just can't be found because there are no grocery stores here. Just liquor stores and Popeyes, Dunkin' Donuts and 7-Elevens, children born into a neighborhood that feels more pollution than solution, it is then I realize that I am not too far from the desert I once dreamed of. See, whether Anacostia or the Sahara, it doesn't make much difference because to Whole Foods, Southeast D.C. is no different than the Serengeti. To them, brown-skinned little boys like my students are nothing more than walking cacti, just a piece of scenery this world has taught everyone to stay away from. Brianna literally has a landfill in her backyard, so she has a hard time convincing herself the world then just thinks she's trash. Restaurants come and dump the remains of food. She'll never be able to afford to eat three steps from her back door. Jose, he's fast food five days a week because his mother works three jobs to take care of six kids and only sees her son when she arrives home from work at the same time he's leaving for school. He has gotten so big that the excess fat bunkering his skin puts added pressure on his joints. His knees are literally crumbling under the weight of this world. Olivia watched her father shot two feet from her front porch. She wants nothing more than to go outside and play at the park after school, but gun violence has made a merry-go-round feel more like Russian roulette, so she doesn't go outside. Simply eats any processed food from the cabinet that will last long enough to prevent her from leaving the house too often. These are my students, my warriors fighting a battle against an enemy they cannot clearly see. These kings and queens meant to feast, not to fester, but their zip code has already told them that their life expectancies are 30 years shorter than the county seven miles away. I can see the faults of my own ancestry shaking in their eyes. Diabetes and high blood pressure run through the roots of my family tree. Heart disease is as much a part of my history as shackles and segregation. So from my father's kidney transplant to Olivia's asthma, these things are more than mere coincidence. Both grew up in places more accustomed to gunshots than gardens. So tell me place doesn't matter. Like the neighborhoods that are predominantly healthy aren't the same ones that are predominantly wealthy because when you're not choosing between buying your medicine and your groceries, health doesn't have to be a luxury, doesn't have to be an abstract concept presented in academic journals and policy briefs. My students overcome more every day than I will in my lifetime. They are the roses that grew from the concrete, the budding oasis in the heart of the desert, and their lives are worth far much more than the things that this world has fed. For, so for me, when I, I think a couple of things about that, um, that video, one is that there are a number of different ways to teach health equity. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, didactic, ed, you know, education in the way that I actually was was doing, you know, previously. It can also be through arts-based uh, methods that really connect with the emotions around, you know, around health equity and, and what, because what residents feel when they're seeing um, the these inequities playing out in front of them with their patients. So Clint Smith was talking about a school but I've heard residents tell very similar stories about patients that they work with and, and how frustrating it can be sometimes to really feel like, you know, I, I feel like you don't know what to what to do and, and recognizing that, um, 
you know, maybe the reason that my, uh, my patient has, has asthma is because of where she lives and she doesn't have any, you know, opportunity to live somewhere else. Or maybe, um, this child, uh, with obesity, um, really doesn't have, you know, no matter what I prescribe as a physician, um, in terms of diet or exercise or any medications, um, because of where this person lives, because of where this child lives, it's going to be an uphill battle no matter what. And so those can be really challenging things for residents and faculty and all of us to really kind of think about as we're trying to address health equity issues. It can feel really impossible. But I think at the same time, what um, what Clint Smith says at the end um, is is really important that these kids are valuable um, and they're worth it, right? And they're worth us working towards um, helping them improve improve their health. Um, and so that's not true just for kids, right? But for all of the patients that um, that residents and faculty and 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 that we work with in health systems. And so I think it's that can really connect. Help that kind of work can really help connect to the the emotions that a lot of us feel feel around health equity issues. And, you know, I think um, personally, I think it's important um, to not ignore that, that, that that's happening and, and really pay attention to that. Um, so I'm going to keep going, but if anyone has any reactions or responses to that uh, video, please feel free to put them in the chat um, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about kind of the framework around some of the things that he was talking about. So what he, what Clint Smith was talking about is structural determinants of health. And that's really um, one of the key concepts within the structural competency model. And so basically what we're saying is that, or what Clint Smith was saying and what we, what the structural competency model says is that it's poverty and inequality or inequity um, that leads to health disparities. Um, th that's, that's really what the, the root of it. And that can, that can show up in many, many different ways, right? But what causes the poverty and the inequity? And that's kind of the question that structural competency asks. So it can be policies, right? There can be policies that um, that lead to inequities. It can be economic systems. Um, so there may be differential access to job opportunities or um, there may not be jobs available in communities. Um, the pay may be low, right? Those kinds of things. It can also be social hierarchies like racism or sexism or um, some of those other um, those other inequities that we see that are really on the basis of who people are, and so those are those those all three of those can contribute to um, poverty and inequity. And these are structures, right? This is what we're talking about when we talk about structural determinants of health. So I'm going to give you an example. This is another um, way to teach about health inequity um, that I think is particularly helpful for residents because it really focuses on um, on the health outcomes that we see. And so this is really what what I'm doing going to do here is to tell a story backwards. Um, and so I'm going to start with. Oops, I hope I'm going to start with. Yeah. So I'm going to start with something that a resident might see. Um, you're being, you're in the, uh, resident is in the emergency department, a young woman comes in and she's really having a life-threatening diabetic crisis, um, and needs, this needs to be addressed immediately. Um, and that it gets addressed, right? She goes into the hospital under observation. Um, they're, you know, work, working that out. Right. Um, but why did she end up there? And that's the question that you want to start, um, asking when you're thinking about health equity. So in this case, she really couldn't afford to self-pay for primary care, and she doesn't have insurance. And so she wasn't really getting any kind of regular follow-ups um, regarding her diabetes. And so it was really poorly controlled. Um, and so she ended up in the emergency department. But why couldn't she, um, wh why wasn't she under, under control other than, you know, not being able to see a primary care physician? Well, she had really started eating more foods that were not on her prescribed diet plan. Um, and so she knew what she needed to do to manage her diabetes in regards to her diet, and she had been trying to do that, um, but she had really started eating a lot more foods that were really not part of that plan. But why was she doing that, right? Um, and so she really can't afford many fresh fruits and vegetables, and I think you're probably starting to get a picture of what's happening here. But then the question is, why can't she afford that? Well, she just recently lost her job. Um, and so she really doesn't have any income com um, coming in. She's having to rely on the little savings that she had. And so she's really being conservative about how she spends her money and about making sure that she doesn't buy any food that can go to waste. So she's buying a lot of non-perishable 
items that can be stored for a longer period of time. Why did she lose her job? Well, she was uh, working in, um, in a, a housekeeping uh, company and clients were canceling services due to COVID-19 and so they didn't need her anymore um, and they let her go. Um, so uh, pr prior to that, she had started cleaning houses with a friend um, who were both, they were both working for the same, um, the same organization. Um, but why had she started doing that work? And the reason is, and this is from my perspective in Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, she, um, she had just recently moved to Las Cruces. She didn't really have many connections, um, but she did have this friend who already lived there. She really needed work immediately, and this was just the opportunity that was open, so she took it. Um, and she had been recently diagnosed with diabetes prior to moving to Las Cruces. Um, why did she move to Las Cruces? There's a university in Las Cruces. She really wanted to attend college. She thought, well, maybe if I move to the town, like I can figure this out. But she just really didn't know how college worked. She didn't know how to get there, didn't know, um, didn't really know what to do. Um, and so um, the reason that she didn't really know what to do is that she really didn't have um, a lot of people who had the experience of college that she could ask. Um, her parents had migrated to the United States from Mexico. They both have lower wage jobs. They never went to college um, and didn't have the opportunity to help try to support her in any way in going to college. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Okay, so this is her story, right? And we can tell this backwards and you can see that there are a lot of different reasons here that this young woman ended up in the emergency department and they don't all have to do with her health behaviors, right? Um, they have to do with, and they, they, some of them have to do with clinical care, but not all of them, right? A lot of them have to do with those other components of the social, um, social, economic, physical environment, and those kinds of uh, larger issues that would be part of what we would talk about as structural determinants of health. So I'm going to share a few of, a few of them. Um, so one is that she is seeking care within a U.S. healthcare system that has a certain structure, right, around insurance um, and who, who can get access to care, um, uh, who, who has access to insurance, those kinds of things, right? And so because she is kind of marginalized within this U.S. healthcare system, she really doesn't have access to consistent primary care. Another issue um, could potentially be that um, limited federal resources focused on emergency or pandemic preparedness. Um, and so when COVID-19 happened, um, there may have been um, some things, you know, that, that could have been done that weren't done um, that really caused a lot of, uh, a lot of havoc for people, which is, around which is around policy, right? Some of those policy issues. Um, she also was unable to collect unemployment um, at the time, um, and mar partly due to not understanding the, the process of how you apply for unemployment. Um, and so, you know, those systems can be really challenging for people to navigate. And she also, again, didn't really have anybody that she could talk to about that. She also lives in a food desert. So the part of town that she lives in is very far from a grocery store. Public transportation is not very good in, in Las Cruces. Um, and so she really had a hard time getting to a place where there were fresh fruits and vegetables. She didn't really have a lot of money. And so she would have to pay money for transportation in order to get that food. She's much less likely to be able to go and get it. And so that's really, that that's also, you know, part of policy that might be able to be developed in a community. Um, she went to public school, um, but there was limited financing in her public schools to, su to provide support services to students. So there weren't really a lot of opportunities within her school for her to get information about going to college. Um, so she had to try to figure it out on her own. Um, there's, we can also talk about, uh, you know, her parents are um, immigrants. So we could talk about how U.S. immigration policy might have affected her job um, capabilities or, um, you know, she is uh, a, a Mexican descent that could have an impact on um, how, who, she, how, what work she's able to do. Um, she could get sort of pushed towards lower wage labor markets. Um, so that's something else to talk about related to, um, related to health equity in this situation. And then ultimately the reason her parents migrated in the first place, if you really want to take a big global look um, at health equity, that they really, they um, migrated to the U.S. because they were experiencing violence where they lived in southern Mexico and felt that the U.S. might be a safer place for them and for their children. 
So I think all this to say, you know, um, you may or may not ag agree that specific policies um, have this kind of an impact on people or that we should, you know, get rid of policies or not get rid of policies. I think the point, the point here is to say that all of these do have an impact, right? And so, um, so we can start to look at the bigger picture of why someone ends up in the situation that they end up in when a resident finally sees them by really taking this bigger picture look. So this is another strategy to use when thinking about um, health equity. Um, we, we, um, one of the strategies that we use in developing our work and our curriculum in health equity is to really think about different levels of intervention. Because let me go back to this. That feels overwhelming, right? Like there's, n I cannot address all of those things that are in red, um, nor, nor, you know, should I, right? Uh, um, try to address all those. I'm not an expert in a lot of these areas. Um, you know, that, uh, the, and, and there's only so much time that someone has. And if I'm a physician, I also really need to be seeing my patients, right? And, and spending the time in, in healthcare. And so there may be different ways that people can intervene and can um, try to work on health equity issues. And so we talk about different levels of intervention um, in the work that we do. And so I, I, um, I'm going to just go through some examples of these um, and then hopefully uh, we should have a little bit of time if people have questions at the end. Um, and again, I'll share my slides so you'll have all of these examples and the links that are in the upcoming slides. But the levels of intervention that we talk about are things that you can do just at an individual level. Just you, um, you don't have to engage with, with anybody else really to do um, this kind of work. The second level is interpersonal, and that's really thinking about how you engage with other people. Um, so whether that's your patients or whether that's colleagues um, or other organizations, just how do you interact with other people? And then there are things that you can do just at your clinic or institutional level. Often these are policy kinds of policies or procedures, kinds of um, issues that can be addressed relatively quickly, especially if it's a small institution that you're working with. Um, we can also work at the broader community level. So how can we partner with and interact with other organizations that are also trying to address health equity issues. Um, we, can do, we can do research, um, and there are a lot of different ways to either do or use research in the work that we do. And then finally, we could address really larger policy level issues um, outside of that kind of clinic or institutional level. So I'm gonna give a few examples of these, and hopefully this will help kind of think about um, what might be possible. So. Um, at the individual level, one example is learning about implicit bias. Um, the MedEd portal is um, something you may be familiar with that um, is uh, available for free. Um, it has a lot of different resources in terms of how to teach um, different topics. So they have an entire um, uh, mod an article and then some resources to learn about implicit bias. And that that's really um, just thinking about you know, how do I think about other other people um, and how might that impact the ways that I interact with them? And are there ways that I could try to start changing my thinking so that I'm um, less biased, right, in my interactions with other people? So that's really internally thinking about, um, thinking about how you perceive the world. Um, avoiding moral judgments of community members. There's a recent article in, um, in JAMA um, that was a, a qualitative study of 600 encounter notes from 138 physicians, and they found six different ways that physicians express positive feelings um, towards patients in medical records, like compliments and approval and personalization. But it also found several ways that physicians express negative feelings towards patients, including disapproval, discrediting, or stereotyping. So in both of those cases, there are moral judgments being made. And so really thinking about um, what impact that might have on someone's care if someone else is reading the note, right, is what that, that study was looking at. And then finally, you can learn more about structural competency. There's an, a whole organization, and they have tons of resources on their website. So um, I included that there. At the interpersonal level, I think, you know, one of the things that um, can be really important is addressing language barriers, um, both through interpretation services, but also really thinking about, you know, using real language, language that um, that patients um, will understand. And I think for me, there's a personal um, personal story here, which is, you know, I have a PhD, and and sometimes my 
um, and I work in medical education, and sometimes my physician thinks I know more about the the medicine than I than I do, and so I, you know, sometimes the level is just too it's too technical for me, and I don't quite understand um, exactly what's happening. So that's what I mean by real language um, to anyone who may need um, who may need that. And there's an, an entire a, a guidebook from CMS um, that I've linked to there. Um, another thing um, to think about is power imbalances among healthcare professionals, as well as with patients, and really trying to shift those. So um, one of the ways that we see health inequities play out is due to kind of hierarchical structures that we see within medicine. Um, and that can lead to a limit limits on shared decision making, um, limiting the information that, um, that an, an entire interprofessional team can provide to help um, work with patients. Um, and so there's, again, in MedEd Portal, there's a, um, an, a, a module and, and resources on how to address those issues. Um, at the institutional level, um, you can think about the policies within your organization and are there unintentional inequities that might be created just by the policies that you have in your organization. Um, and so again, there's a MedEd Portal reference there, but um, just, to give, just to give an example, um, of, of something that I have seen um, in, is the policies around um, people being late to appointments. And so a lot of, of clinics will have, you know, if you're more than 15 minutes late to your appointment, your appointment will be canceled, you'll have to reschedule, you might have to pay anyway. Um, and when you're talking, when you're looking at uh, working with a population where some people don't have access to their own transportation and have to rely on either public transportation or maybe friends and family to get rides to clinics, that can really create an, an inequity in terms of their access to care if, the, if you have this policy that, they're, um, that their appointment is canceled. Um, that they have to do the work of rescheduling, right? Those kinds of things. There's obviously a balance that has to happen there because you have to have clinic, you know, appropriate clinic flow, but um, but that can really disadvantage patients who don't have their own access to transportation. Um, another uh, example is just restructuring physical space to make it more accessible to clients and community members. And again, CMS has a um, has a, an entire guidebook about how to increase physical accessibility of healthcare facilities. I'm going to keep going so I don't run over time. Um, in terms of the community, really creating opportunities for community voices and leadership within your organization can be a really important way to address health equity um, issues. Um, I'm, I'm promoting my own organization here. We have a toolkit for creating community advisory boards on our website, um, which is, is um, accessible to anyone, so you're welcome to use it if it's helpful. Um, and partnering with other organizations that are working on the same issues as you. And this is part of that, um, part of addressing the overwhelming feeling um, that can come about when you're trying to think about health equity issues. Um, there is a course that is available for free um, that's an introduction to structural competency that has a lot of examples of ways that community organizations have worked together and have worked with healthcare facilities um, to address health equity issues that you can, you can take that course for free if you're interested. And then finally, or well, I think I have one more after this, but um, in terms of policy, you know, developing relationships with your elected officials, um, writing op-eds or policy position papers, um, Sco the Scholar Strategy Network has a lot of resources about how to do that if that's not something that you've done before. Um, and then really thinking about the policies within your organization through a health and all policies lens. And so the idea there is really thinking about how every policy that we create can have a health impact and what is that health impact? Is it positive or negative? Um, so including policies around work hours or when people can take breaks or um, or around um, the, the schedules, right, that people have, those kinds of things can all actually impact health. And so being able to kind of take that perspective and look at policies that are created in that way. And then finally, um, research. I think, you know, using accepted forms of evidence to point to structural causes of health disparities is really important. Um, and there is plenty of that out there. So, um, so I think that's, uh, that's just a really, that's a really important piece um, to think about is how can we demonstrate that there actually, um, 
that these structural causes that we're identifying really do lead to health disparities. It's complicated research, but it does exist. Um, you can learn about the histories of current policies and practices. I just have one example there. Um, and keep up to date on current research and, and areas of interest in your community. Okay, so I'm going to um, s s just kind of close out there and see if, if people have any questions, comments, or ideas. But I think, you know, what I was trying to do today was really first give you sort of a brief overview of how I think about health equity in the in the work that I do and hopefully provide some tools and resources that are useful for you if you're teaching other people about health, health equity as well. And then to really think about what does that mean in graduate medical education and what can that look like um, in, in terms of how, how we train residents um, and how we enact health equity work in our own organizations. Um, so hopefully those examples are helpful to kind of start to think about what are some concrete steps that we can take, because I know um, often that uh, that overwhelming feeling, especially when when you're just starting to learn about health equity and all of a sudden you're seeing all of these issues that are contributing to poor health outcomes for patients um, it, that weren't that you weren't really aware of before um, that can feel overwhelming. And so having some some specific ways that you can kind of take one step um, to addressing health equity hopefully is helpful. But I'm happy to take any um, any questions, comments, other ideas that people have. Here comes one. Okay. Oh, do you think medical anthropology classes should be required in medical education? I mean, I will admit my bias um, on this, but I do, I really do think so. I think that the the perspective in medical anthropology is really a holistic perspective that allows you to take a look at that big picture and make those connections between um, those social and structural determinants of health and health outcomes. Um, I think having a having a medical anthropology class that is really specifically focused on what is it that medical students really need to know is is important as well because um, I think it's it's um, people need to, students need to be able to make the connection between those big broad concepts and what they're actually going to be doing as a clinician um, and so I think that's a really important piece of those medical anthropology classes but um, I, I am biased but I I I really do think we should have medical anthropology classes as well. I have to also say as well as genetics, um, because there's a lot of confusion between um, what is genetic and what is social, um, social and structural. And so, if if medical students and residents can have a really much more clear understanding um, of the differences between those, I think that would be really helpful. And I'll just second Cliff's comments. Um, thank you so much for all the resources you shared. That's always helpful and appreciated by membership. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. I do see Paula's put another comment there in the uh, in the chat box, but we will have the slides available if anybody wants to reach out. Um, you can reach out to me. It's A-O-R-W-I-G at Indiana R-H-A dot org. So A or WIG at Indiana R-H-A dot org. Dr. Scott will be sharing those with me. I'm certain that uh, you can reach out to her with additional questions if you have any. She's been a great partner to us, but we appreciate everybody's time and thank you so much for joining us.